Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Paul Brody. I'm the Global Blockchain Leader at EY. And this is the start of our 2020 Global Blockchain Summit. So normally I'd say I'm really excited to be here, but actually I haven't actually gone anywhere. Although I am very excited. I dressed up today. Uh, I showered. This is, our this is our fourth Blockchain Summit. Uh, it's the first clothing optional one. And I, I will admit that's not the path we sort of envisioned when we started planning this event, but I, we're going with it. Um, and by the way, if you need to take a break at any time during today's event, just pick up your iPad and you can take it with you to the bathroom. So, you know, very relaxed uh, environment. I do want to be clear, uh, those options are not available to the presenters. So thank you for joining us. We have an amazing agenda for today. So John's gonna put up the today's agenda schedule. You, you may have seen it rotating around a little bit. I'm gonna start off uh, uh, today with a little bit of a keynote about our vision for blockchain. Uh, the summit is called Going Public for a Reason. And it's because we really believe that public blockchains are ready for prime time and they're ready to create business value. Um, I'm also gonna talk about some of the major product updates that we are either releasing right now or are coming over the next few months to blockchain.ey.com. After my opening talk today, we've got four rounds of case studies. So first, we're gonna look at how governments are using EY blockchain technology, right? The world is about to unleash trillions of dollars of public spending, and we, are, we have uh, solutions that are focused on accountability and managing that public spending. Secondly, we're gonna dive into the pharmaceutical supply chain and then after that, we're gonna talk about the new payments platform that we're working on with Nacha called Sixtias. And then finally, we're gonna dive into sustainable manufacturing, traceability, and inventory management. We have an amazing panel lined up there. To close out the day, today, we have a fireside chat, no fire, but lots of chatting, with Joe Lubin and John Wolpert from Consensus. They're gonna talk with us about baseline, public blockchains, and the future of Ethereum. So just a truly amazing agenda for today. Uh, and uh, we'll, before I go in a little bit more, I want to talk to you about uh, the agenda for uh, day two and day three, which are coming up uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Tomorrow is a deep dive into fintech, audit, and tax. I know, I know, some of you are thinking to yourselves, audit, how exciting is that? Or maybe it's not exciting, but let me tell you, the reason you don't think it's exciting is because you've never been arrested for money laundering. Um, we also have an awesome, Opening keynote tomorrow, the CEO of ANSA, Italy's national news agency, is going to be talking with us about fighting fake news using blockchain technology, which is going to be amazing. And we're going to wrap up, we're going to bookend tomorrow's discussion with a talk with Bob Bench from the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is going to be amazing. He's going to talk to us about stable coins. And we've been sourcing questions uh, from Reddit for, for some of that conversation. Uh, and finally, day three, it's a deep dive into blockchain technology in particular. We're going to be looking at how privacy technologies like zero knowledge proofs and baseline allow us to deploy complex business applications on the public blockchains. And uh, we're going to do a bunch of demos. So we're going to take people to blockchain.ey.com. We're specifically going to dive deeply into OpsChain 4.0, which is the first version of OpsChain that's built on baseline, uh, which is with a technology that we have been developing in cooperation with Consensus. Microsoft, and now something like 15 other companies in the DeFi ecosystem. It's all about enabling complex business operations securely and privately on public blockchains. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And by the way, if you want to get a sampling of some of the stuff that's going to be available on blockchain.ey.com, you can head over there at any point uh, and you can actually sign up for a free account and you can even start testing out our free uh, blockchain security testing service, which is available to the general public. Now, in addition to our main events, we have some guest stars lined up for today. In fact, we have guest stars lined up every day. So today we have uh, two guest stars, Travis Blaine, who is known as DeFi Dad. He's the host of the Ethereal podcast, and David, Hoss David Hoffman, who is the COO of Realty, a tokenized real estate company. And they're going to be joining us uh, after the keynote today and again later on tomorrow. So uh, you're really going to love this. As I like to say, you'll laugh, you'll cry, it will be better than cats. So uh, I'm looking forward to our guest stars today. Now, uh, before we get into the keynote, I want to do a few kind of shout outs to the people who've done a tremendous amount of hard work in making this possible. So first of all, there is an operations team at EY and 
30 days ago, we said, oh, gee, it kind of looks like April 21st in New York City might not be happening. So I am, I'm super bummed. I want to go out all the time now and like practice unsafe business practices like handshakes and dinner in small restaurants. But this team took everything and turned it around in 30 days. Marek Heinsmith, uh, you're amazing. Kaylin Smigelski, Eli Wilson, Lindsay Reichelt, Mihir Kulkarni, John Frechette. You guys uh, did an incredible job. And I want to do the thank yous at the beginning because people always tune out at the end. So I'm a little shameless about that. Also, I really want to give a shout out to the Ethereum Finance Forum on Reddit and specifically to JT Nicole, who's one of the moderators there. He has been incredibly helpful. I don't think there's any place where we get better analysis and more insightful questions than the Ethereum Finance Forum on Reddit. So uh, that is uh, uh, hugely important to us. I'm very, very grateful to that. And finally, just want to kind of hit a, something of a bit of a elephant in the room. I've heard some complaints, especially on Reddit. This is the one thing I'm a little unhappy about, about my t-shirts. And so I, I have an entirely fresh collection of t-shirts that I will test out this week on you. And then you can write in and tell me uh, which ones you hate the most. All right. So now I'm going to get started with the actual keynote presentation. And I'm going to share my slides. All righty. It's keynote presentation time. Thank you, everybody. So welcome to the EY Global Blockchain Summit for 2020. I'm Paul Brody. This is our keynote presentation. The theme of the summit and the talk, the purpose of my talk today is really around this topic of going public, right? Uh, we've been talking about public blockchains, uh, privacy technology, and tokenization for the last few years. But it's been hard to get going, right? Uh, and the reality is now things are moving along really nicely. We have had an incredible year of solid progress. This industry has been transformed in the last year. And it's time to create business value. And I'm talking very specifically here about enterprise value creation and the value of working on public blockchain, shared public networks. So that's the agenda for today. And then I'll kind of wrap up a little, some few thoughts about what it means to business now what we can expect to see over the next couple of years, and what might happen to the whole industrial ecosystem in the years beyond that. Let me start with a bit of a recap, right? We have had a year of amazing progress. And yes, it's been a very, very challenging year, right? Uh, there has been an end to what I like to call blockchain tourism by large companies. Uh, there was a time, which I fondly remember, when people would come to them like, hey, I have like a half a million dollars. What kind of blockchain can I get for that? And those were great days, but they weren't really driven by uh, lots of return on investment. And those days are for sure over. High volatility and poor returns on crypto assets. Now, I made this slide a couple of weeks ago, and I have to say, if I had known what was going to happen to the price of oil, I might have changed this around. So it turns out your investment in crypto, way better than oil. I hope you didn't buy too much oil. Um, and then, of course, regulatory uncertainty. We live in a global patchwork of regulation. And even though there's been a lot positive progress. The reality is when you talk to some of our clients, they tell us that uh, they are deterred in some cases about pursuing particular opportunities because they're not sure about what will be legal in particular jurisdictions and what won't. We've also had a lot to learn in this process about how to make great enterprise blockchain applications, right? And uh, there's been a lot of learnings along the way, right? Starting with, it's been too complicated in the past to explain return on investment, right? Uh, some of the stuff that we've been uh, thinking about and we've seen other companies do requires too many words to explain it. I think we have really gotten to a much better position over the last year in terms of explaining return on investment. Also, though, too difficult to use. And this is, if there's one thing that you will see at blockchain.ey.com is a single unified user interface for people to go and use blockchain business tools just like a traditional business application, a SaaS application. And then finally, not secure enough, right? This has driven so much of our work in thinking around uh, public blockchains and privacy technology, right? The whole architecture, the design of baseline from the ground up is built on this idea 
that you don't have to worry about securing enterprise data on a public blockchain if you never put any sensitive data on an enterprise blockchain. So lots and lots of big challenges over the last year, and I think a lot of progress has been made. Um, now, in facing up to these challenges, although business has not continued to grow at the blistering pace of last year, we still managed some very decent progress. Our blockchain project continues to grow uh, quite substantially, and it continues to grow across all of our service lines. So uh, without sort of disclosing too many numbers, uh, the, the numbers continue to move up and to the right, which I, I feel very proud of, especially in this challenging environment. And by the way, I can't say enough things about how proud I am of our development team who have not missed the beat in shipping product and delivering to clients uh, during this crisis. Uh, very proud, I'm very proud of the progress that we've made around our core flagship business applications tool, which is EY Ops Chain. So we continue to win, deploy, scale out new customers. We have a magnificent set of clients in food and beverage, amazing companies like Carrefour, the House of Roosevelt, Super proud of one of our newest members of the team, Japan Croft Sake Company, right? Uh, you can start to have some really, really fine dining uh, with uh, blockchain-based technology. Drugs and medical supply chain, Canadian blood services, something that we're also immensely proud of, HSource. Uh, HSource is notable because when they're one of the first users of our core privacy technology around zero-knowledge proofs, and Merck Animal Health, which is a great use case of mixing uh, off-chain technology with RFID and IoT technology. Logistics, uh, we're all over logistics and we're making incredible progress, especially in Europe uh, and in terms of tracking inventory and creating uh, valuable tools and technologies. Uh, fund management uh, and public sector. So the Fixius platform that we're diving into with Nacha is, is really amazing. It's gonna transform how payments are done in the US. And we're especially proud of the work we're doing with the city of Toronto around public sector finance. And that's actually the next presentation after this one is a deep dive into government and technology. And then finally, labor management, right? We are headed into a world where a lot of people need new jobs and very cool uh, vision that Block2 has around enabling both the temporary workforce and supplying them with the assets they need to be productive. Sorry, this is a little part of the, the kind of the bragging part of the presentation. Uh, but it's, it's fun and it's important to recognize it. Uh, in particular, I'm going to dive in for one moment into the city of Toronto and the work we're doing around public sector finance management, we're making a lot of progress with uh, clients uh, at this time. If you think about how governments operate, right, they establish central budgets and then they lay out programs for, say, healthcare education that in turn have metrics, whether it's graduations or uh, immunizations, uh, the healthcare systems provide lots and lots of services for people to engage and connect on. And they in turn pass money onto projects, uh, whether it's school construction or MRIs or vaccinations. And so consequently, what our solution enables the city of Toronto to do is to get over time better visibility and all clients to get better visibility into how that money is being spent and how it's aligned to specific results in a particular government agency. Right. And the idea is to be able to do this without imposing a single centralized IT system on all the parties. Uh, the other thing I've mentioned a couple of times is we've really shifted towards a SaaS application model. So we sit on top of blockchains, but we make it very easy to use. Our very first offering is smart contract review. That's been available in beta for about three months now at blockchain.ey.com. Uh, and I guess officially today, I'm proud to say it leaves beta and becomes an official production service, still free of charge, but it's moved on a lot. So right now we can test for four different things. We can test for functionality. And I believe this is very important. We can tell you, does this token that you're about to buy actually comply with things like the ERC-20 or the ERC-721 standard? Security, does it comply with known security standards? Quality. Right? How can we have some measures of code quality and gas efficiency? Right now we have 87 tests that are specific to the ERC token, uh, ERC 20 standard. We have another 58 general tests that support kind of the full range of, uh, of blockchain applications. And we're building out a couple of other really cool things that are coming later this year, including support for the ERC 721 standard, uh, the ability for any user to define their own tests and a mainnet simulation tool where you can say, well, if I did this, 
what would happen. And it will allow you to see how your token would behave on the public Ethereum blockchain. We've also made great progress over on the audit side of the business. We've got over 130 blockchain insurance clients right now. Our blockchain assurance technology, our platform, which is Blockchain Analyzer, is now available in 95 countries. And we have a slew of new uh, uh, blockchains that we are going to be supporting over the next few months. And it really supports a truly global digital audit model, not just a sampling of transactions, but 100% of the client records. And I would say if, you, if you're looking at a company, if you're thinking about, gee, should I put money into them? Uh, you know, remember those old Got Milk commercials? You might ask, you know, Got Auditor? Because uh, audit is incredibly important. It's great when somebody says, trust me. It's even better when an independent party can verify the truthfulness of their claims. Through all of this, if you were to boil down the EY vision of what we think blockchain should do, it comes down to one sentence and it really hasn't changed. We believe blockchains will do for networks of enterprises and business ecosystems what ERP did for the single company. Now, some of you are thinking to yourselves, my gosh, what is ERP, right? Or why did I uh, ever want to get involved in the ERP implementation? And the answer is ERP, enterprise resource planning is a tool set that really made companies operate from end to end, large enterprises, so that the left hand knew what the right hand was doing. If you ordered, if you ordered a product over in, in Kansas, it triggered a supply chain activity off in China, right? That's what ERP did, but it only worked inside of large enterprises. What blockchains will do is allow networks of companies to operate as tightly and as fully integrated a manner as if they were a single enterprise. And I think that's kind of immensely important when you think about uh, how it is that companies operate efficiently. And as a part of this, a couple of years ago, we laid out a set of steps that we thought needed to be taken in order to get from the current environment of blockchain to where it's one that enterprises can use on a regular basis. And what I'm pleased to say is I don't really have to update this slide. I can just pick it up from a presentation two years ago and use it again. Step one, which I think we've really moved through, notarization to tokenization. If you were to go back, to ancient times, which is blockchain and the world of blockchain is just two years ago. Uh, people were mostly talking about notarization, but really blockchains are designed to make, move, buy, sell, and transact around tokens. And so the first critical transition, and I think the one that's really happened and happened nicely is a shift towards tokenization. Number two, a shift from cryptocurrencies to fiat currencies. Now I don't say this because I don't like cryptocurrencies. I like them a lot, but enterprises like fiat currencies. And they like fiat currencies for a very understandable reason. They're less risky because if your revenues are in dollars and your taxes are in dollars and your employees are paid in dollars, then you would prefer to do your other business transactions in that same currency. So one of the other things that's been really exciting to see over the last couple of years is the explosion of stable coins that allow individuals and enterprises to transact on public blockchains in the currencies that they prefer. Thirdly, integration of blockchain into the regulatory environment, right? From separated to fully integrated and regulatory compliant. One of the most important things you wanna be able to say to your chief financial officer when thinking about, hey, should we use blockchain is, you probably won't be arrested, right? That's, I think that's a positive value proposition. Most CFOs that I know will not do well in prison, right? And so being fully integrated and regulatory compliant is very important. And the progress that has been made on that front over the last few years is just kind of staggering, right? It's really amazing. Uh, we did some research last year, which we put out a press release on. You know, if you were to look three or four years ago, 0% of blockchain transactions were covered by a KYC, Know Your Customer Rules, or AML, Anti-Money Laundering Rules. By last year, that number was up to 80%. Now, 80% is not 100%, and if you're desperate to find a loophole, it's probably still there. But that progress from zero to 80% happened in just a couple of years. And I would wager that if we were to redo that analysis uh, a year from now, we'd be closer to 95%. And then finally, the other migration that had to happen was a move from private blockchains to public blockchains. Private blockchains do not scale. And I don't mean that in a technical sense. I mean that in the sense that private blockchains don't make it easy for companies or individuals to transact with a huge network, right? To join a private blockchain means lots of fixed costs. It means lots of transacting. 
uh, uh, and a customized setup. On a public blockchain, just like the public internet, we can all transact with each other. But to get there, we have to have privacy on public blockchains. And that I feel like is one of the other ingredients that's really come into place over the last year. So we believe, put very simply, that the future of B2B transactions are private, secure, regulatory compliant smart contracts denominated in fiat currencies on public blockchains. Now, yes, that's a bit of a long sentence, but it gets it in one sentence what we believe the future of those uh, business transactions look like. So that's a bit of the picture of both where we at EY have come from and where we think we are going. I want to spend a few minutes now talking about the industry changes that have progressed over the last year, because it has been immense. And in particular, I would say there's been four major shifts. The first is the one that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention, uh, but is going to be immensely important in the long run, which is China, China's emergence as a blockchain superpower. Secondly, the development of DeFi, which has been the one that we have spent the most time talking and thinking about uh, over the last year and is, is absolutely transformational for the long run. Thirdly, widespread acceptance of public blockchains. The world has changed enormously from a few years ago where people are like, whoa, public blockchains can't do that. And then finally, industrialization of privacy. And I wanna hit through each one of these in a little bit more detail. I particularly want to dive into the case for China because China, we sort of lost track of this announcements that came out of China at the end of last year, where people said, hey, uh, you know, President Xi said China should see the moment around blockchain technology. They made it a national priority, right? And then the coronavirus hit and we forgot about all of that stuff. But make no mistake, that project, the initiation of those programs is back on track. And you can expect China to become a major global blockchain power. In fact, the truth is, they already were. China has 62% of all of the world's blockchain patents already, right, by country of origin. Now, you can have arguments about the quality of the patents, et cetera, but these companies are very influential. They're going to have a big impact. And I think historically, we may see blockchain as a key turning point in the technical ambitions, the technology ambitions of Chinese companies in global markets. Secondly, it is a mistake to assume that what happens in China stays in China. In fact, if you look at this chart, which I shamelessly uh, took with full credit, I guess, to McKinsey, right? This is data on uh, Chinese imports, exports, and foreign direct investment in a number of countries around the world. And you can see for quite a few countries, China's either a major customer, a major supplier, or a major investor. Right. And I think it's not unreasonable to believe that where Chinese investment and imports and exports go, we can also expect to see the adoption of Chinese technology standards. So China is going to influence not just their own domestic market, but the other markets where they have significant components. And you can see that I think we will see something that might look like a digital Belt and Road program as well. We foresee three major blockchain ecosystems emerging in China over the next few years, which may eventually consolidate down into two. The first is the digital currency electronic payment system that is starting to be rolled out. In fact, uh, if you've been watching the press, the beta is already out there. People are starting to play with it and use it. Uh, so, so segment number one are payments, right? This is digital payments only. It's initially just between banks, but eventually it will between, be between individuals. And very importantly, Right. We believe the future of DCPE, DCEP includes not just payments, but also smart contracts, because that is essential for how businesses transact. Right. The foundation of pretty much all business transactions are I have money, you have stuff, and we are going to exchange them subject to the terms and conditions of a contract. Secondly, there's a large number of domestic private blockchains that are emerging in China and uh, unlike some of the rest of the world, we expect to see significant interconnection between those networks. And the reason for that is that the regulators in our discussions with them have made it clear that they believe it's very important to avoid kind of locked up walled gardens. So we expect to see interconnection both within those domestic blockchains and over to the DCEP system. And then finally, everywhere I go in China, and I was there at the beginning of January, uh, talking with uh, a grump, uh, you know, whole groups of, of people, both business and government, 
they are very much aware that China is deeply connected to the global trade and investment ecosystem. And so there will absolutely be connections to and from other global blockchains. Uh, I think most especially the Ethereum blockchain, where Chinese companies are already uh, one of the largest players in that ecosystem. We think over time, there will be interconnection between uh, the DCEP payments environment and these multiple private blockchains. And this will allow a large scale network to emerge in China for business to business transactions and business to individual transactions that are entirely digital and are based on smart contracts and enable the transfer of assets and other complex services. And we believe that they will over time interconnect with the other global blockchain ecosystems so that Chinese companies can import and export as well. So this is going to be a humongous global blockchain ecosystem and it's going to have a reach out into the rest of the world and significant influence on a number of countries. China is going to be a big power and it's going to be very important. Second topic I want to cover a little bit more quickly, not because it's less important, but because everybody has spent much more time talking about it, is the emergence of decentralized finance or DeFi, right? This really lays the groundwork for enterprises and, and individuals as well to embed financing directly in their business operations. Right. The idea behind DeFi is that we can take financial services and turn them into Lego blocks. Right. So I can snap them together and I can create loans or insurance or other services as I need. So if you think about a traditional business transaction, right, I've got money, you've got stuff. Once I have a contract, if I have a purchase order from you in a DeFi ecosystem, I ought to be able to obtain working capital against that purchase order. And once you ship the product, I ought to be able to say factor your receivables if the terms of our deal are that you say uh, going to pay me in 30 days. So uh, this ecosystem lays the foundation for digitized componentized financial services. And very importantly, it does so in fiat currencies, which is the way that enterprises like to work. And when you add to that the ability to do so with full privacy under baseline, you start to have the foundations of a tool set that companies can use in routine business transactions. And finally, I think for me, the most unexpected and hopeful trend from this year, or I should say thirdly, not finally, but the most unexpected and, and really hopeful and exciting trend for the last year is the hugely accelerated interest and openness to public blockchains by enterprise users. Historically, individuals have been the ones who've been comfortable with, with the, these public blockchain environments which don't offer transactional privacy. But what enterprises are discovering is that this mess of interconnected, overlapping, or not very well connected private blockchains doesn't work very well, right? If you form a network of companies all in the same industry, well, unfortunately, the problem is that most companies in the same industry don't actually buy from each other. They buy from other industries, right? The, the car industry buys raw materials from steel and they buy logistics and they buy insurance. And so if you get together and you form a single industry blockchain, it's not actually that, that convenient. And sure enough, what we found out over and over again, we did a survey is we asked people, have you joined a private blockchain? And if so, which one? And it turns out almost nobody has bothered to join enterprise consortia, but for every one company that's willing to be a participant in some other company's network, two companies started their own. Now, the math here is pretty simple. What this means is that on average, a private blockchain, other than the founding company, has 0.5 participants. It goes without saying, it's pretty hard to build a network effect on 0.5 participants. And what's really amazing, what was really gratifying is when we then asked the companies that had done private blockchains, what are your plans for the future? What they overwhelmingly said is that they believe that public blockchains are the future because the biggest problem to building out a blockchain service is it's a network and you need other participants in your network. So that for one, as, as somebody who's been talking a lot about private uh, blockchains and the need to shift towards public was incredibly gratifying. The last big transformation that we've seen in, in 2019 was about enabling private transactions. And here, I think more than anything else, I believe that EY had a really positive and important role to play. If you go back to October of 2018, we released a prototype application uh, on the public Ethereum mainnet called OpsChain PE, public edition. 
and um, it had the wonderful ability to enable private business transactions on the public Ethereum ecosystem. The only downside was the per transaction cost was a measly $100 in gas, which is way too much computing power for a feasible transaction. Fast forward about six months to April 2019, and we introduced an open source public domain application, which we shared out called Nightfall. And we got the transaction cost down to about $10, right? And as of December, we contributed another round of technology uh, into the public domain with batching and other improvements that got us down to about five cents. So at $100, we don't really support a lot of transactions. At $10 in gas, as some number of transactions become feasible, but at five cents, it becomes absolutely feasible and reliable to use privacy technology in every one of your kind of core blockchain business applications. And uh, we have released further code improvements for Nightfall technology. And we're really happy. The number of participants who are starting to add to this code base and work with us around it is just amazing. And in the last uh, month or so, we added a couple of other things which I think are immensely important, which are regulatory compliance tools. So we now support whitelists, blacklists, and integration to audit tools. So our goal is really to get you to the point where you can do secure, private, regulatory compliant transactions on public blockchains. Now, the cool thing is I can do a chart in a log scale as well. And now that we've all spent the last three months looking at COVID charts, we understand how log scales work. So, uh, but it just doesn't look, it does not look as impressive as this one. So I prefer this one. All right, now, all that being said, it does not mean that there aren't significant challenges to making blo public blockchain usable. And sometime around the middle of last year, we really started to think about what is it gonna take to make public blockchains truly usable for enterprise applications? Because we could see the finish line approaching where we would have regulatory compliance, low cost private transfers, but what else did we need? And the answer is quite a bit. Let's start with private business logic. If you and I have a contract and our payments are private, but our whole contract is out in public, it's not very useful. So we need private contract logic as well as private uh, payments. Secondly, we need business identity and discovery, right? How do I know that you are who you say you are and that I am transacting reliably with other business partners? Thirdly, we need more than just financial transactions and token transactions. We also need messaging and process state synchronization, what my friend over at Consensus calls middleware functionality. And finally, we need the ability to help enterprises manage the way that they tokenize and, and produce their assets and other technologies. So from this initial goal of private transactions, we came up with a laundry list of other stuff that needed to be done to properly industrialize this infrastructure. And the result of our thinking around that, and then our discussions with Consensus and Microsoft, was the creation of the baseline protocol. And I think this is one of the areas that, that really is going to have a big long-term positive impact on public blockchains. The baseline protocol is a tool, is a set of tools that's designed to allow enterprises to coordinate complex, multi-party business processes with payments and transfers with privacy, and very importantly, never putting sensitive enterprise information on the blockchain. That is the vision. And the idea is that if you and I and, and my 5,000 closest friends are engaged in a complex procurement transaction, we can set our baseline together, and then we can stay in sync on all of the things that need to happen, and that the baseline protocol fully supports things like tokenization and decentralized finance, so that if I issue you a purchase order, you can use a DeFi ecosystem under full privacy to get working capital against that purchase order. That is the vision. So if that's the vision, what is EY's product roadmap? How are we gonna get from where we are today to where we would like to go in the future? Right? That is, that's where I wanna take us now. Our vision, just to recap, hasn't changed. Blockchains will do for network of, networks of enterprises what ERP did for the single company. And as I like to say, if you haven't had the life-changing joy of an ERP implementation, let me break it down for you a little bit. 
Blockchains are going to integrate information and process both within and across enterprise boundaries. And tokens and smart contracts are going to become the standard ways in which companies transact with each other. Our path to getting there has also become quite a bit clearer over the last year. And we've got, I would say, five key principles that are really governing our approach and product development. Number one, enterprises need to be able to do secure private business transactions on the public blockchain. Pretty simple, very basic, right? If you come to me and say, Paul, I have a great idea for a blockchain solution, but we can only do it on private blockchains, my answer is probably going to be, uh, unless you can see a path to public, I don't see us investing in it. Number two, users need to be able to understand the risks and the value of smart contracts before they enter into them, and they need to be able to do so without being software developers. This is the genesis of our smart contract testing solution. We wanted to be able to take code and turn it into parameters that people can understand. If your prospectus says, we will never issue more than a million tokens of this variety, you should be able to check that in the token code without actually having to be an expert software engineer. Number three, transactions that should be auditable and regulatory compliant. I know this is a no brainer, but it's worth repeating. It's very important. We have our regulatory compliance, we have our audit and we have our tax teams and they all sit together. We are one blockchain team at EY and we don't design things without thinking about what are the audit tax and regulatory consequences of, of bringing them together. User experience and ERP integration needs to be simple and it has to support existing industry standards, right? Our goal isn't to create too many complex new systems. Our goal is to make this as simple as possible uh, and, and to keep it the user process and the user experience relatively straightforward. And then finally, the gold standard for security, for reliability, is to make core technologies public domain and open source. And I really want to emphasize the public domain and open source part, right? There are lots of people out there who are talking about their open source technology, but their open source licenses come with all kinds of special gotchas and, and surprises in them. Our open source licenses don't come with any surprises and gotchas because we don't have any licenses. We, when we put something out into the public domain, we have chosen to relinquish ownership over that asset and control over that asset and make it fully available to the public with no surprises. And we want it to be fully publicly inspected. That's the only way that you can have a truly gold standard of compliance uh, and security and privacy. Because the truth is, there is no shipment of software that doesn't come with bugs, right? And the only way you can reliably find bugs is if the code is used, it's inspected and it's publicly available. All right, I'm gonna get off my uh, soapbox there on that. For us, when we talk about user experience, everything comes together under blockchain.ey.com, right? And, and we are integrating all of our solution and vision into that environment. So the starting point of blockchain.ey.com is this core set of foundational services that are really essential to every kind of blockchain experience. You need to be able to create and manage tokens. You need to be able to create and manage smart contracts. You've got to have a directory of your business partners. You need security and forensics. You need tax and compliance, right? And you need to have transaction analytics and monitoring. So from those foundational services, we can start to build our two core product platforms. The first is called EY Blockchain Analyzer. This is our main audit analytics uh, platform. This is where you understand what's going on in your business on a blockchain. Secondly, EY Ops Chain. This is where you do things on the blockchain. You run your business operations on a blockchain. Into this environment, we want to offer enterprises and users the easiest possible set of, of integration points. So the starting point is always a clean, simple web user interface. But on top of that, we also have RESTful and GraphQL APIs. And very importantly, EDI and XML connectors, right? So we have spent 30, 40 years building up an entire library of these business to business standard messaging protocols, right? EDI messages tell you when products have shipped, they allow you to have purchase orders. There's no need to reinvent the digital purchase order 
it already exists. There's no need to reinvent the digital shipment notice. It already exists. It's been created in EDI. It's been recreated in XML. We should just be making use of that. And then, of course, finally, we want to plug into ERP, especially the big ones like SAP and Oracle, right? There are no large enterprises that cannot run, uh, that, that do run without ERP, right? If you want to enable procurement, supply chain, infrastructure management, it all plugs into ERP. And the best user interface for ERP is the ERP user interface that people are already trained on, right? From ERP, you can go with our vision, you go directly from your ERP system, your purchase order goes into the blockchain and it looks no different than if you sent it by EDI or you printed out a copy and you faxed it. From there, we will be able to interact with both public and private blockchains. Now, our priority is the Ethereum public blockchain for which we will support both business applications and audit and analytic services. In addition to that, we're gonna support a number of other blockchains from a, a more of an analytics and audit perspective only. For example, Bitcoin uh, is the first one that we're supporting in the, the blockchain.ey.com. We already support a whole bunch in blockchain analyzer in the legacy version. In the new version, we will continuously add more and more of these blockchains to this environment. In addition to that, we plan to support private Ethereum instances and quorum uh, uh, in the near future for uh, blockchain analyzer. Although we are very passionate about public blockchains, I believe that, you know, I understand we have to meet some of our clients where they are, and that means they're not all ready to go to public blockchains. What we love about private instances of Ethereum and private versions of Quorum is there's an on-ramp there. There's a path from a private blockchain to a public blockchain that doesn't require that you rebuild every piece of code that you have on the way or redefine or redo every asset. And then, of course, we plan over time to add additional services around analytics, uh, both for uh, other cryptocurrencies and crypto asset blockchains, as well as private blockchains on different standards. Today, we're announcing the deployment of three new applications, which were going into test phase, will be available for demo, and we'll be showing those applications on Thursday. And then they'll be available to enterprise clients uh, a little bit later on this year, and I don't have an exact time date. Um, in the EY blockchain analyzer environment, we already have uh, smart contract view is up and running. Uh, and that one has uh, moved along very nicely. In addition to this, we're going to be launching a visualization tool relatively soon. This will allow you, it's basically a kind of a block explorer on steroids. It was built uh, by us based on advice and work that we did both with our supply chain practices, as well as our forensics practice. So whether you're chasing stolen Bitcoin, you're trying to find out what happened to a vaccine or a pint of blood in your supply chain, you'll be able to use blockchain analyzer and the visualization tool to really understand what's going on in the business environment. And then we're also gonna be releasing a new version of our tax calculator that supports a tax calculation initially for the US, but eventually globally for all kinds of bot purchases and sales of crypto assets. Over on the off-chain side, the first product that we are going to have in our uh, blockchain.ey.com environment. It's called EY Ops Chain Network Procurement. It's our first product that we've ever built on baseline. And it's kind of gonna be our flagship in terms of pushing forward around privacy-based enterprise-ready uh, blockchain solutions. So let me tell you a little bit about kind of what our vision is for network procurement because it's, it's immensely important to our future. Um, oh, wait, I forgot. First, let me give you a quick preview of our new analyzer tax calculator. So it's gonna support currently US tax rules. We are gonna be moving over time to support global tax rules. Uh, key features, capital gains and losses. For the US, you'll be actually be able to download and automatically populate your uh, IRS form 8949. And you'll be able to keep track of your changes from year to year, right? Right now, this is deployed as an EY internal solution. Uh, it has an enterprise version that we're going to make available, and I hope eventually uh, we, we will get the full regulatory compliance uh, and regulatory go-ahead for a consumer version as well. Secondly, uh, here's a quick picture of our visualization tool. As I mentioned before, the block explorer and the data visualization are really important. You will be able to track whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum assets across the entire network. We're starting out with Bitcoin, so the service is available 
uh, for enterprise users in beta now to have a look at the Bitcoin side of things. And our plan is to add Ethereum and related blockchains over the next few months uh, uh, and enable the support of all of the digital asset models that are emerging out there. Now, let me come back to a little bit of discussion about Opschain 4.0. And in particular, our first module that we're putting into blockchain.ey.com, which is the network procurement module. The problem that we are trying to solve with network procurement is a pretty typical enterprise business process, right? Procurement happens all the time. It's the main way, the truth is procurement is the main way that two non-financial sector companies interact, right? They buy stuff, they make it into other stuff, and they sell it onwards. And so a, in general, if, if you look at a lot of manufacturing companies, something like 60 to 80% of their revenue, it turns around immediately and goes into stuff they buy, right? So why start with procurement? It's incredibly important. Uh, and in particular, the reason we started with procurement is because when you're thinking about a platform like Baseline, and it's great to have platform ambitions, but platforms don't go anywhere unless you can do one thing really, really well to start with. So we picked that. And we picked this also because as I mentioned, it's the main way non-financial entities tend to interact with each other. And very importantly, it's perfect for blockchain. When you're buying stuff, you're buying specific finite assets and you're moving money against those assets based on a set of contracted rules. It's perfect for an application of digital tokens and smart contracts. And finally, it is really broken. And I wanna talk about why procurement is so broken. You would think that buying stuff is simple, but it's not. And it's not because the world has changed so much and the technology that serves companies in the process of procurement has not. So if you were to go back 50 or 60 years, if you're a student of history or manufacturing fan like I am, right, you would go back to a company like Ford, their River Rouge factory might have been considered at one time the greatest factory in the entire world, right? Uh, it was an incredibly vertically integrated car factory. And that vision, that history of vertically integrated manufacturing meant that if you were the owner of a vertically integrated system, the most important thing you had to do wasn't to worry about other people, it was to worry about what you did internally. If you fast forward to the types of companies that are building a lot of stuff today, if you look at say the Foxconn uh, iPhone factory in Shenzhen, they have a different model. And that, that model is that they don't actually do a lot of the manufacturing in Shenzhen, they do assembly. Right? And they're coordinating this incredible global ecosystem in order to produce millions of products from hundreds of suppliers uh, and then distribute them out across the network. And so what happened in the space of 40 or 50 years is that we went from the most important thing is for me to get control of my own operations to the most important thing is for me to be a conductor and a manager of this huge global network. And the problem is we are now in this era of network competition, but networks are not static. They are not simple. Right, so if you think about a company that's a network leader, they have subsidiaries, sometimes they're buying them, sometimes they're selling them. They have business partners and subcontractors, sometimes they're adding them, sometimes they're subtracting them. Across this ecosystem, it's very complex to keep track of. And running this large scale operation when you're, the bar is constantly moving is really tough, right? If you have a volume purchase, right, and everybody gets a volume purchase discount, how are you gonna keep track of all the volume you purchase? Right? How are you going to keep track of your total spend of a, the particular supplier if some of that spend you're eventually paying for, but it's being purchased by a subcontractor? How do you get the correct pricing? If a subcontractor is buying something for you or an overseas subsidiary is buying something for you, right? and that price depends on how much stuff you have bought, then uh, how do you keep track of that without disclosing sensitive information about how much you or your other parties or your other subcontractors are doing, right? It is very complex and it's very broken. And I don't think there's a chief procurement officer out there who doesn't know that their procurement process is very well designed and is probably still leaking money in, as a part of this, right? And so to put it very simply, you cannot run network level procurement inside the four walls of your enterprise. It has to be run at the network level. Right, uh, and so the vision behind EY Opschain Network Procurement is that we want to operate in a world of business networks, not just individual enterprises. So if you think about a typical transaction, you may have a buyer network with a lead buyer, and you have a seller network with a lead seller, and they are going to negotiate a master agreement, and we are able to turn that master agreement 
with its discount tables and authorized buyers and authorized sellers into a digital privacy enabled baseline compliant smart contract on the public Ethereum network. Then it's easy to add subsidiaries or subtract them, add authorized buyers and so on. And the same thing over on the seller side. And so with this network procurement infrastructure, we can actually create a system where the entire buying network can keep track of all of their procurement spend and the entire selling network can be fully compliant with that process, right? So that is the vision behind network procurement in a world where enterprises need to be highly distributed, but work together. Now, let me give you a little bit of a taste of the value proposition here, because I think it's incredibly important, right? And I wanna share with you an example from one of our most beloved clients with Microsoft. I am so grateful to them. They've been an amazing partner and an amazing client. And the work that we've done together on the Xbox game network has really been instructive, right? And I'll just share a couple of quick stats that will give you a sense of how procurement can be so transformational. When we shifted Microsoft's paper contracts to the blockchain, we cut the cycle time required to correctly calculate the royalties Microsoft owes to business partners by 99%, 45 days down to under a minute, right? And by the way, 99% improvement, that is generally considered good. Number two, we cut the cost to administer the system. We estimate fully deployed 40% less expensive. And number three, we created a much more transparent system. You can see all of your transactional data. You can't see others, but you can see your transactional data and you can see how those rules are applied to you as those transactions occur. So we believe solving this value proposition problem around procurement is immensely valuable, right? Now, it is fair, let me do a little bit of a detour here. It is fair to ask and reasonable to ask this question, which is everything I just described can be done with a web server. So why should it be done on the blockchain? And I believe the answer to that is relatively straightforward, but it's important to go over this. It's important to recap this because sometimes people forget. They say, oh, I can do that with a web server. Yes, you can. And the problem with web servers, the problem with the web 2.0 approach to this is it creates a central authority that can see and control everything. And over and over and over again, the story about the modern digital world is that these centralized web services, these digital marketplaces, aren't just friendly connectors of buyers and sellers, they turn out to be predators. They don't create a level playing field, they look at all the data that's going through their networks and they optimize it for their benefit, not for participants. The beauty of public blockchains is there is no central party, right? You can have a true connectivity, you can have all the business process tools of a private web-based system without the potential of facing a monopolist, a new competitor, or somebody who wants to be both. So that is the reason to do it on blockchain. And it is really important when you step back into this environment to ask yourself, why am I doing this with the blockchain? Because it's not always easy. In particular, I want to talk about why doing it with a blockchain by itself is not enough. You must do it with a public blockchain because otherwise all you've done is recreate another version of the private central marketplace, but with data replication, right? Our commitment to public blockchains and open standards really means literally no locking, right? You can work with us and you can leave us tomorrow. I hope you won't, but you could, right? The two key things here are number one, open standards. We don't do proprietary standards. Number two, public blockchains truly fully decentralized ecosystems with no monopolist in power. And when you put that together, what you get are a bunch of great stuff, easy onboarding, right? Nobody has to fire up their own private blockchain infrastructure, which is expensive. You have a choice of tons of different providers, right? No predatory intermediaries, way lower cost, right? We see right now on average running on a public blockchain per transaction, somewhere between 95 and 99% cheaper than doing the same work on a private blockchain and much, much higher integrity. Only if somebody tells you that their private blockchain is immutable, they don't understand how blockchains work. The only blockchains that have immutable transactions and truly tamper-proof transaction registries are public blockchains. So, as I said, 
you can use EY, you can use blockchain.ey.com today, and you can leave tomorrow and you can take all of your data with you. And you'll suffer no penalty, no loss of capability, no loss of functionality. Right, and with baseline, we've gone far beyond just encrypting transactions. I've talked about this before, I've mentioned it a couple of times, no private data on the public blockchain. Let me just dig into a little bit more about as to why that is. Number one, zero knowledge proofs, right? We replace actual data with mathematical proof of that data. Number two, secure private messaging. So we make sure that you're able to communicate with the other business parties without leaving a permanent record, right? And it keeps the identities of the users private. Number three, blockchain is middleware. So not only are we having contract and moving data, but we're also able to synchronize our process, right? Very traditional concept from the world of, of core business technology, essential to be replicated at a global scale across companies. Off-chain storage, right? If you need to move data, you don't have to put it on the blockchain. You can put it off-chain. And what that means is that if your systems ever become compromised, you can cut the connection to that off-chain data, and you can make sure that nobody can, can retrieve it, nobody can decode it. And then finally, proxy re-encryption, which is a great way of, of encoding your information in a compartmentalized manner. And this is the, one of the other key features of the blockchain and baseline vision, is data is compartmentalized. So if I do business with two other parties, they all can only see what they are allowed to see, and I can only see what I'm allowed to see. And that is built into the encryption architecture by design. So all of those things are intended to support a tremendously secure private infrastructure that runs on public blockchains. I'm really happy to say EY's network procurement is going to be available in beta uh, in May and uh, at blockchain.ey.com. And I hope for uh, client pilots and testing uh, shortly thereafter. The good news is once you do a pilot on blockchain.ey.com, Right, you can get a full sense of the end-to-end -end user experience. We'll show a part of that on Thursday, right? And then you can start thinking about multiple different ways to scale it up. You can add buyers and suppliers, you can do system integration, but you can literally start, when this is fully deployed, you will be able to start blockchain-based network procurement in under a day. That is our goal, that is our strategic vision. So, before I wrap up, I want to take a few minutes and talk about what we think all of this means for the future. All right. I dug up this slide. I've been using it for five years. You can accuse me of a lack of originality, but I like to remind people about the kind of attention cycle that exists in technology. Right. For the last year, the truth is we've not been paying much attention to blockchain. But the, the, also the truth is that blockchain technology does it, like all technologies, tends to do its most important work, its most progressive work, when the world stops paying attention. And I dug out this slide, and I love this uh, Gartner slide. It's a hype cycle from 2002. And uh, I showed it to the EY leadership the first year when I went in, I said, I'd like a ridiculous amount of money to invest in this absurd technology. And I said, by the way, right now you are hearing about, you know, all this cool stuff about blockchain, right? People are telling you how amazing it is. And let me just assure you that a year from now or two years from now, People are going to be telling you that blockchains are stupid and pointless and we should have never wasted our money in them. And when they tell you that, I want you to remember that in 2002, people were saying stuff about things like that, about speech recognition and public key infrastructure and voice over IP and Bluetooth, stuff that we use every single day today, thousands of times reliably without even noticing, right? That's how technology matures. We are now in this trough of disillusionment and we are climbing our way up the slope of enlightenment. And uh, the foundations for market success happen now. They happen while people are not paying attention. And so a year from now or two years from now, somebody's gonna be like, wow, this blockchain stuff seems really useful. Let me tell you by then, if you are not in this business, you are too late to have a leading role in it. I think, it's impossible to have a conversation about blockchain right now when we're all stuck in our pajamas or in our apartments without talking about what's going on in the rest of the world, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. And I was inspired to go look at what is the history of technology adoption? And the answer is, it doesn't seem to slow down for very much. Technology adoption in US households is something that kind of moves around 
uh, quite a bit, right? There's definitely ups and downs, especially during big periods like World War II, where if you wanted a dishwasher or a car that used steel and there was no steel available. But if there's one theme that has emerged over the last 50 or 60 years, it's that if there's been anything going on over time, it's compression of the technology adoption cycle, right? That is probably the only consistent theme. And even when there were setbacks, those setbacks occurred only briefly, a year or two here or there, but otherwise technology adoption has been quite relentless. And so I believe it will also be true for blockchain technology. Now, beyond basic adoption, we need more than just DeFi, right? We need a wide range of industrial capabilities if we want to transform how enterprises work. And so if you go back to kind of the basics, right? When I started in the world of supply chain, there was kind of five things, right? You, you could say in a very simplistic and shallow manner, the companies did five things. They bought stuff, they made stuff, they moved it, they stored it, and they sold it, at least if you were in supply chain, right? And that is buy, make, move, store, and sell are kind of the five basic themes and uh, that, that kind of exist consistently across the world of supply chain. DeFi, this decentralized finance movement, has created a model where we have financial service Lego blocks that can fit into each one of these spots. We need more than just DeFi. We need DSYS, decentralized systems, right? We at EY, we're trying to start building those procurement manufacturing operations, replenishment planning, sales contracts, right? For every financial service in buy, make, move, store, and sell, there are corresponding sets of systems, services, and financial services. And finally, we need DOPS. We need decentralized operations. There are decentralized operational services that we can build out as well. Raw materials, procurement, 3D printing, air freight, warehousing, many, many, many of these systems can be digitized, standardized, and deployed as kind of Lego block-like services, right? And so the vision, my future vision, the thing that I think will be possible in a blockchain-based world is one where companies can assemble the Lego blocks they need to build an end-to-end -end solution. And those Lego blocks assembled by even a small company will be as tightly connected and as operationally efficient as large enterprises are today when they're linked up through a vast, sophisticated ERP system. I believe this will fundamentally reshape the global economy over time. Probably not overnight, but I think it will change how we see competitive environments in the world. So for example, if you look at this great piece of data from the US Census Bureau, and it it's nicely put together a chart from The Economist, uh, but it looks at US census data for the enterprise. And it's a good proxy, by the way, for what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, industries, the, the dots that are above the diagonal line, those are industries that are becoming more concentrated. In other words, fewer competitors taking a larger share of the industry, right? And that has been the most consistent trend over the last 20 years. And it's not an accident. And it's not an artifact that just kind of happened it's driven by technology, right? We live in a world, as has been so elegantly put, software is eating this world. And software is eating this world in part because once you make a big fixed cost investment in software, your future is a zero marginal cost environment. Throw in zero marginal cost with network effects and you have a very powerful system that starts to get people more and more fully integrated. And then add on top of that, the power of vendor lock-in from proprietary software. And what you end up is with more and more industries that are dominated by companies that are driven by their software power. Blockchains have the ability to genuinely transform that ecosystem model. So we keep the zero marginal cost and we can keep the network effects, but you don't have to have vendor lock-in. You can have on public blockchains with open standards, true open access. And when that happens, you will end up with real transformational competition. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, but I believe if public blockchains succeed, we won't just reshape how business is done. We will reshape the broader global competitive landscape. So on what I hope is a positive note, I'm going to wrap up my conclusion. I thank every single person who is still awake uh, uh, and watching this. 
And uh, I would like to ask John Frechette to uh, read me out any questions if we have any. Yep, sure, Paul, sounds good. So we're getting uh, lots of really good questions from Reddit, YouTube, and, and the Q&A portal here. I think one of the ones you touched on it during the presentation, but just to clear it up for everyone, is baseline open source or public domain? Baseline is open source and public domain. And uh, I think um, uh, if you uh, go online, you'll be able to just Google it and you'll find that the code repository. Yep, sounds good. And then another one I think we've gotten multiple times was why exactly Ethereum is our platform of choice? And does EY support any other platforms? So from an audit and tax perspective, we support a whole range of platforms. We support Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, uh, uh, Ripple, Hyperledger, right? Almost any platform we fully support in a, uh, a audit and tax environment. When it comes to software development, we've made a very focused choice. And the, the truth is, you, I don't think we can make great software if we write it on many, many different platforms. And one of the reasons we picked Ethereum, we picked Ethereum for a couple of important reasons. Number one, it is simply the largest blockchain infrastructure out there. It has the most developers, the most users. Number two, it's one of the few choices that has both a private version and the public one. And the nice thing about having both a private and a public version is if you're not comfortable with the public blockchain yet, you can start in a private blockchain version of Ethereum and when you get comfortable with public, we can easily migrate you into a public environment and we don't have to rebuild everything from scratch because you've basically been developing the same core infrastructure. Okay, thanks, Paul. And then this next one's a really good question. In what ways can Baseline help transform traditional business practices beyond time and cost efficiency? And a follow-up is what new business practices or partnerships do you envision being possible? So fundamentally, even though we started with procurement, the idea behind baseline is that you can use it for any type of business to business transaction. And to me, the key criteria that make baseline suitable are the following. Number one, do you have more than two parties involved? If you just have two parties, it's relatively straightforward. But the minute you have three or four or five parties in the transaction, think about buying something with financing or logistics, or an insurance contract where you have an insurer, you have an inspection service and maybe a reinsurer. The minute you start to have multiple parties, it gets complicated to coordinate those processes. And so with baseline, you can have this common process coordination infrastructure um, uh, that's deployed on a public network with full privacy. Uh, I see it applicable to almost any business process in which multiple companies interact. The key constraint is uh, how quickly can we mature the standards for uh, tokens and contracts, and how quickly can the private business logic be developed? Because that's probably one of the most challenging doing private business logic for the private contract over the public blockchain. Thanks, Paul. And, and it, you know, it's a shame we won't be able to get to everyone's questions because they're, they're all coming in very quickly and they're all awesome questions. One of the ones from YouTube Live is, are there any learning resources to get on board with implementation with EWA's blockchain protocol and tech? And, and let's add baseline to that list as well. Uh, so we will post uh, later today a link to the, the baseline repo. We've actually handed over baseline. We are so committed to the public domain open source component that in cooperation with Consensus and Microsoft, we've actually given up control of baseline. There's, there's more than 20 companies now, I think, engaged on this. We've handed it over to a foundation that's got control of it, and I don't have the link off the top of my head. Uh, there's also some other EY code that we have contributed just generally to the public domain, and that you can get, I think, at the github.com slash, uh, I think it's EY blockchain, but we'll post that correct link as well. And, and shame on me for not having that at the top of my head. Okay. All right. I'll keep pouring through these. So another good one that came in was, uh, are you, is your position that private permission blockchains can't be transformational? And are there any applications that will still be supported by private blockchains 10 years from now? That's a great question. Uh, uh, certainly, I think private blockchains can absolutely be transformational. The one that we are doing for Microsoft on the Xbox platform, that's private blockchain. Now, we started that two years ago, and we just could not have done it on a public blockchain. So private blockchains can absolutely be transformational, right? They're more expensive, they're harder to implement, 
but they can be transformational. And they work especially well if you have a smaller ecosystem with a very uh, a set of partners who are closely collaborating with each other. So they can be transformational. Um, 10, 15 years from now, I, I can see two types of blockchains continuing on in the private ecosystem. Number one, stuff that has just started in private and has a, hasn't changed much and, and people don't want to move, right? Stuff, you know, think about Y2K, right? You know, my mother was a mainframe software developer. They didn't think that any of that stuff would still be around in Y2K, but it was, right? Uh, stuff in IT tends to last much longer than we think it's going to. Um, secondly, I think some defense applications in particular some government agencies will, maybe rightly so, never really get comfortable with a fully public infrastructure, and, and that's understandable. Although I have to say, you know, most militaries do use public cloud now, and they use uh, uh, the public internet. So uh, perhaps I'll, I'll hopefully be shown to be wrong on that one as well. All right, thanks, Paul. And then, uh, what about Ethereum moving to proof of stake in Ethereum 2.0? Uh, what is your opinion of that and how will it affect EY's sort of suite of blockchain products? So the transition from 1.0 to 2.0 and the transition to proof of stake is not going to have any substantial impact on our stuff and our vision and our plan. I think in general, uh, yes, it has taken longer than many people had hoped, but in, in overall result, it's very exciting to watch the Ethereum ecosystem make really good solid progress, right? They have had their forks, they've had their issues, they've moved uh, over a bunch of times. It's come together very nicely. And uh, it's been, especially over the last year, really encouraging to watch that go on. There's other blockchains and other sort of digital communities that have really struggled with some of this transformation. And so it's nice to see that even in a, a public ecosystem with ups and downs, the progress is steady and consistent. All right, so another one coming in from YouTube Live. And just so you know, Paul, we've got about three minutes till we move into our next presentation. Uh, what kind of quality of life improvements do you see being made to make interacting with blockchain applications more palatable for people with little to no technical background? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, blockchains are fundamentally a B2B technology, and we need to hide the complexity from most users, even in the business environment. The fact is most users don't really need and shouldn't have to be coders. That was a big thing that led us to blockchain.ey.com. We had an experience last year, great humiliating story, which I'll share. Um, we did a project for a client and we showed them the final output. And we thought this project was amazing. And the client looked at it like, well, is there a blockchain in there? And we're like, yeah, of course there's a blockchain in there. And at the end of it, they're like, well, we're not really sure, how do we know? And uh, it turns out that many of the people in this client just didn't have the deep technical skills to recognize the blockchain code kind of going through the, 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 the motions. And we also failed to create a user interface that was easy enough for people to see what was going on. I refer to this as our failure to create a little dancing smart contract uh, that you could see stuff was happening. And as a result of that, it would have been very easy for us to draw the wrong conclusion. And the wrong conclusion was, gee, we should have had a smarter client. That is not the right conclusion because the client's job isn't to know blockchain code. The client's job is to understand the business process. And so our takeaway was we need to make blockchain simpler and clearer and cleaner. And we need to have a consistent single user interface uh, and, and hide some of the immense complexity. So, I mean, zero knowledge proofs, incredibly tough math. You will not have to know that math to do private transactions to blockchain.ey.com. That is certainly my hope. All right, thanks, Paul. And we've got the last one here. We have one minute till the next uh, breakout starts, but um, a, a timely one is, can you expand on how you think investment in blockchain might change due to COVID-19? So in general, I have kind of a couple of hypotheses and I really emphasize their hypotheses about how major crises tend to affect technology. Number one, they tend to push really hard on legacy technologies and they often tend to speed up their retirement, right? As companies, they shrink, they shrink to what they like as the new stuff and the new capabilities. And then when they start building again, a couple of years from now, as companies kind of start back into their growth mode, they're gonna to wanna to grow again with new technology. So 
That's kind of step one. It accelerates technology transitions. Step number two, it accelerates business model transition. So business models that look weak but stable often get knocked down by major crises and it often creates room for new business models to grow up. So, uh, you know, a huge rush. If you go back to 2008 or 2009, there was this incredible explosion of dynamic startups that were created in the aftermath of that crisis. People got laid off from jobs and instead of going to find another job, they started their own company and they recruited all these able-bodied and talented engineers who also were looking for new jobs. So I think we will see an explosion of innovation uh, coming out of this crisis. I, I sure hope there is a silver lining because the reality of it is, of course, really painful right now. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. So I think we're at time here, we have so guest we'll stars. go into the next break. Fantastic. We have our guest stars for our break, right? Yep, that is correct. All right. So I want to welcome uh, Travis and David. Uh, they are our first guest stars. So Travis, aka DeFi Dad, is the host of the Ethereal podcast, and David is the COO of Realty. Uh, welcome, uh, Travis and David. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me, everyone. I probably should just introduce ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I work on the Ethereal Summit, uh, which is uh, happening May 7th and 8th. It's very similar to this event. So if, if you're having a great day, I would invite you to register at etherealsummit.com slash register. Uh, we've actually had Paul speak before. Uh, but yeah, uh, I've been working in the space for about three years, uh, mostly on Ethereum related projects. And I host a podcast now where we focus on bringing to light the stories of founders and those that are building on Ethereum. So anyways, just super happy to be here. And, and Paul, I, like I said, I love your shirt. It's, I have, I have no criticisms, just, just really enjoy the t-shirt. Thank you. I got more on that, where that came from. And uh, David, please do give us a little bit more of your background, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm David Hoffman. I'm the COO of Realty. We do tokenized real estate on Ethereum. So we take uh, US properties, put them into an LLC, bundle them up, and then the tokens represent uh, shares of that LLC, basically producing what is ownership in real estate on Ethereum on the public mainnet. Uh, and so the idea is that we're democratizing access to real estate, um, putting more assets on the blockchain for things like DeFi to leverage. Uh, and I, I see that really uh, adjacent to what you at EY are doing. Now, um, Paul, you, you, this is really exciting. And, and your first, the, this first hour of this presentation really just made me very aware how you, how you and EY gets it. Uh, the ethos of public permissionless blockchains, along with how these are systems like by the people for the people, uh, I, I think a lot of people miss and they don't understand because it's not really a subject that most people really, it's not intuitive. Now, at the same time, EY is going after institutional and enterprise adoption. And so we have these two ends of the spectrum where we have like, the, the money by the people for the people, which is like Bitcoin. And then there's Ethereum, which is like code by the people for the people. And, and so we have these two ends of the spectrum where we have the people and then the enterprises. Where do you, where do you see these two groups of people converging? Uh, how, where do we meet in the middle? Like where on Ethereum do uh, the, the people, the little guys talk to and engage with the big institutions? How do you think that's gonna look like? That's a, that's a really great question. Now, we obviously serve primarily large enterprises. I really believe the big value proposition for a lot of people is going to be the ability to use these technologies and services without actually having to uh, uh, be very technically proficient. But what I hope is that there will be lots of apps and services which allow people to access these things directly and have a level of visibility and control that they didn't have to have before. You shouldn't have to be a software developer to be able to have a decent level of visibility control into your business ecosystem or your personal finances. Fantastic, fantastic. And then as a follow-up to that question, uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, these are naturally permissionless systems, which means that to engage on these systems, you don't need to KYC. You don't need to uh, state who you are. The, the compliance of these systems is always uh, uh, an interesting beast to tackle. 
Uh, and so when enterprises come on to mainnet Ethereum and public permissionless blockchains in general, uh, how, and you can see this in tokens like USDC, where if you want to get USDC, the KYC is on the fringes, but not in the center. Uh, how do you see institutions and, and enterprise uh, overcoming this hurdle in the long term? And how is EY helping with that? So uh, yes, it's, it's, it's at the edge of the network, but that's how the internet works as well, right? All the real brains on the internet is at the edge of the network. The internet is a permissionless, permissionless network. And one of the most frustrating questions I get all the time is like, if you're an enterprise, gosh, how can you use the public blockchains? And the answer for me is like the same way you use the internet, right? The internet's permissionless and yes, bad things happen on the internet. There's the whole dark web. Just because that exists doesn't mean that enterprises are somehow gonna get sucked into that. So, what we aim to do is to create a safe, reliable, regulatory compliant environment for enterprises. We're not trying to police the whole blockchain. We're not trying to police everybody. We just want to make it easy for companies to do business that way. And we think that way will ultimately uh, uh, be better. And by the way, you know, the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of people want to be regulatory compliant. They want to stay within the law, right? Yes, there, there are bad people out there, but that's not certainly not my target market. So uh, Travis, talk to me a little bit about sort of the DeFi vision, right? So, so uh, David's got uh, tokenized real estate, right? Uh, DeFi, I believe, is, is hugely important, but without privacy, uh, DeFi, I think, will, will struggle to get enterprise adoption. Where do you see privacy? How quickly do you think DeFi will convert to a privacy-centric model? As soon as humanly possible. I know uh, <laughs> from, from my own experience in DeFi, uh, and, and by the way, just in case anyone is, is new to DeFi, I, I always assume that someone in the room is scratching their head, wondering what we're talking about. Um, think about DeFi like it's, it's basically like new finance, similar to almost email. And think about your current finance system like letter writing back in the 90s. Uh, you have something that is just much more efficient and effective, and it's, it's completely peer to peer. So. Uh, a good example of this with, with DeFi, what I've been thinking about is uh, how, can, how can the average person ultimately benefit from being able to put their money to work? And I come from a very middle-class background. My parents really probably only used a savings account growing up. But when you use DeFi, you have access to lots of services that are traditionally available, I'd say, to folks with a lot of money. And so... Uh, Ultimately, you know, if, if you're using DeFi, you, you want to find ways of lending your stable coins to earn interest. Uh, you can potentially uh, you can potentially put your stable coins into a pool, and folks are ultimately doing trades, and you're earning fees. Uh, so, so the part of your talk actually that really interested me is that you know I spend most of my days thinking about how can I dumb down DeFi for for the average person who's again, maybe just has like a savings account. And so I think about with enterprises, how they might participate in DeFi in the future. Uh, so Paul, do you ever have conversations about how enterprises are thinking to participate in DeFi? Like, like I'm wondering, do you foresee uh, businesses taking out loans uh, or potentially lending their money to allow it to earn interest? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, so you know, think about manufacturing process, right? So I, um, every supply chain, I have a joke, I always like say every supply chain ends in a village somewhere, right? So, you know, you got, you got your sophisticated manufacturing environment, right? You've got your semiconductor facilities, but, you know, I've been out to villages in rural China where they make microphones and other components, right? Every complex supply chain has a, a point at the end. And the companies at the end of that supply chain, whether they're in Wichita, Kansas, or a province in China, they all have the same needs. They're not jumbo sized companies. They need working capital. And what's funny is this tiny company, which is off in, in somewhere that's, that's not well known and it's not a big city, right? Their end customer, four steps down the line, is one of the world's most famous companies with a AAA credit rating. So if this company, they can borrow money at a very low interest rate. This company over here struggles for the banker to even take their phone calls. Right. Imagine a blockchain based link from the purchase order at the big company that's selling stuff as it flows all the way down across to the individual enterprise. And so my hope 
is that what will happen is SMBs will bring this forward. They will say, this is an easier way for me to generate working capital, right? If you think about something like what David is doing with, with real estate, tokenization, if I can tokenize my assets, if I can borrow against them, I can free up working capital. Uh, working capital is a life or death thing for small companies. And I see this as potentially one of the first areas where SMBs will see big benefits from blockchain. And David, actually, and with is, that, maybe let me turn back to you. Do you, you know, obviously, Realty, I think, is, is primarily consumer focused. Two questions I'd pose for you. Number one, where do you see this going? Uh, is this something that's going to be useful for enterprises? And secondly, uh, are you guys looking at embracing kind of privacy technology? Yeah, yeah. So privacy technology is something that's really interesting to me personally. Uh, it's the, the thing is, and something that EY is putting, uh, I think, in the, the correct emphasis on is standards. Uh, while we totally want to get, you know, all the privacy features that uh, have been created and all the, the innovation and, and R&D that has been surrounding privacy, that's all great, uh, but nothing has solidified, nothing has turned into a standard. Uh, and so uh, with um, you know, real estate and tokenized real estate, you can see like the auto report of every single uh, Ethereum address that owns uh, the real estate, which is really cool. But also it's starting to become a little weird because then you're also, if you, uh, we, we send out rental payments to the people that own the properties. And so then you start to generate this kind of trail that is very public and open and it doesn't match people's traditional finance system. If I Venmo you $20, uh, you don't get to go see where where that came from out of my bank account and then also see the real estate that I own at the same time. That's not something found in the traditional world. So getting privacy uh, is like when people are buying fractionalized real estate, they're buying tokens that are 50, 100, $150. That doesn't matter too much. You know, $150 doxing that amount isn't that big of a deal. But when it comes to institutions like they're they're going to want that privacy they're going to be able to have their books kind of behind the scenes uh and so uh in in the long-term vision of realty absolutely being able to um keep your assets close to your heart and just have that have that compliance be there because it's baked into the token but still be able to have the freedoms and the uh, the possibilities by a public permission list blockchain uh is definitely something that that we're going for. And, and I don't think that we're going to be able to really convince large scale institutions or large scale capital uh, owners to really come on and use our service until privacy standards have solidified. Hey, Paul. Fantastic. So, yeah, we, we're just coming up on a two minute warning. So what I want to do is give each one of you a chance to have a bit of a closing statement. Uh, mm -hmm. So let me start with you, Travis. Yeah, um, actually, so I guess my closing statement was uh, more related to, to a question for you. Uh, wh when I think about software in, in the legacy world, you know, I, I buy software because it saves me time, it saves me money, and it potentially uh, grants like access to something that's solving a problem for my team. So when I think about DeFi, of course, that to me, it's very clear because I have, I have the ability to... Um, save time, save money, but ultimately I have the ability to access services anywhere in the world with a Web3 wallet. I, I was mostly interested in, as you think about baseline protocol, uh, how, do you at I, how do you at EY think about how that grants greater access? The time and money is super clear to me, but just how do you all think about, uh, yeah, enabling greater access to the services you provide? So uh, we're just, we're almost out of time. The, the short answer is, um, when things are componentized and standardized, it's much easier to have a huge range of business relationships. Uh, uh, David, uh, final closing comment from you before we let uh, we go off to a government X.O. Yeah, I just I think I just want to say how uh, remind everyone how important this this whole new revolution is, in, in, at least in, in my opinion. And let's not forget that this is indeed a revolution in the way value is managed and, and ownership is tracked and just, and value is such an important concept to just the world at large. And Paul, you said this in your, in your presentation where there's a lot of people that are taking undue cuts of what they are able to, to take. And I really believe that these public protocols really are the next revolution in value management. And that, that directly goes to the heart of 
uh, people's lives and the quality of people's lives. And so while, while Paul and the EY team are talking about innovations and technology and enterprise adoption and standards, I think what we're really talking about is how do we speed up this revolution to positively impact people's lives directly. And so Paul, tip of the hat to you and, and EY for putting this conference on and, and again, getting it because EY is one of the few companies that, that I see in this space that really get the, the values and ethos of public permissionless systems. So thank you for everything you're doing.